Thanks, Monica. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us uh, for our second career workshop of the day. And uh, I think this one actually is going to be perfect for both uh, job seekers and a lot of the hiring managers, the business owners. So um, I, uh, I want to just really briefly talk about our virtual career expo today and then what Palm Beach Tech is. Um, my name is Nikki, I, Nikki Caboose. I'm the VP of development for Palm Beach Tech. Um, we have, which I'm sure most of you know, our virtual career expo today. Um, the platform, in case anybody was wondering, wondering uh, is open all day, so 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and what we're doing is we've have, uh, we had one career workshop this morning, which you can find on our YouTube page now, which we'll drop the link in chat so you guys can find all those. Um, of course, the one we're doing now. And then I think our last one is at four. Um, so what we have is uh, basically we're using a platform called Premier Virtual. They're also a member, a local startup company. Um, you can get in there, apply for jobs. Um, you can research the different companies by seeing their website, any social media links. Um, you can apply directly or there's chat function and video function as well if you'd like to try to talk with anybody or uh, chat with the hiring managers uh, behind the booth. Um, Palm Beach Tech, we are a tech nonprofit. We started almost exactly five years ago. We'll have our fifth year anniversary, uh, actually event, uh, which Monica, if you can drop the link in um, chat as well for that. And then Allie on social, um, that'll be July 29th in the evening. Um, and we just made the announcement that we're gonna be expanding to become a South Florida regional organization. So with us being, yep, thanks Todd. I know we're super excited, it's getting like closer and closer. <laughs> Only about two weeks away, um, but uh, we uh, basically we work with a lot of the uh, local colleges, universities, the coding schools, of course, our uh, companies that are headquartered here um, to help them find uh, local tech talent, um, helping with educational resources such as today. Um, we also host a lot of like um, intro to coding type classes, which I know Todd, our instructor this morning, actually hosts those as well. So um, definitely check out our website. It's uh, palmbeachtech.org and you can visit the event section. Oh, sorry, the dogs are barking. Um, and, um, and make sure that you guys get involved, uh, attend the events, meet some people. I know it's you know sometimes harder virtual, but obviously the more that you attend, the more people get to know who you are and get connected in the community. Um, I want to pass this off to Todd and Jen. I didn't know, if, Jen, if you were gonna talk, but, <laughs> or not, if we just go straight to Todd. <laughs> I know with the lab, with uh, with one of the other schools, they actually have somebody that kind of introduces the speakers. So I figured, because uh, Jen, for anybody that doesn't know, um, Jen is basically the main operations organizer over um, at Boca Code with Todd. And uh, Todd is the founder and lead instructor. And uh, Todd, if you want to talk a little bit about just who you are. Oh, sorry again, my daughter's running with the dog. <laughs> If you want to talk a little about who you are, what Boca Code is, and of course, um, if you want to go straight into your workshop, uh, please feel free. Great, yeah. Um, so you don't have to look just at my face. I'll I'll throw my slides up here in a second. But I'm I'm Todd Albert. Um, I kind of came to this career through a somewhat secure, circuitous route. Um, I started out in academia. I was a college professor. I taught middle school. Um, college for 15 years, did, was a NASA research fellow, did a lot of studies on ice sheets and glaciers and remote sensing and field research for NASA and all kinds of fun stuff. And But I've been programming since I was a little kid um, and loved it, always loved it, never really considered it as a career. And about 10 years ago, shifted from academia to tech and um, you know, always missed the teaching side of things. But you know, tech is is I just love the tech community, especially the the tech community we have here in South Florida. Um, you know, that's why I'm I'm such a big fan of you know Nikki and Monica and and Ali and everything they're doing at Palm Beach Tech. Um, but I've I've recently combined my my academic background with my coding background to start a coding school here in in Palm Beach County called Boca Code, and uh, you know that's that's where I've got my right hand here, Jen Nelson, who's our, you know, she works as, you know, we're, we're, we're a young startup, so she does everything. She's operations, she's admissions, she's, you know, <laughs> social, she's everything. Um, I mean, we have quite a team. We've got an awesome team, but she's no small part of that team. So I'm going to be talking to you guys today, today, if I can get things rolling properly, bear with me, there we go, um, about 
how to hire the right developer for your project. So, you know, I've, I've been on both sides of this equation for, you know, very often the, you know, in terms of being on the hiring side and being the higher, the higher E and the higher I guess is the, the right way to say it. So, um, I, I have a lot of insight into this and I wanted to share some of that insight with you guys. And um, again, I'm Todd, I'm the, the, both the lead instructor and the founder of Boca Code. Uh, and, you know, I just wanted to recognize Palm Beach Tech for sponsoring this and, you know, ask you all, Nikki already said, check out palmbeachtech.org. Also, please check out bocacode.com as well. So here's what I wanna run through with you guys, um, hopefully, fairly briefly and quickly. Um, in terms of hiring a developer, kind of dissecting what do you need. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest places where some companies struggle. You know, some large companies, they know exactly what they need. I need this developer that does this at this level. Um, and that's great. Um, but a lot of smaller companies or entrepreneurs, they don't really always know exactly what to look for. And then there's also, you know, what do you ask? How do you talk to these developers? How do you assess, you know, what you're getting and, and if you're getting the right person? And, and then who to look for, like where to go and what, you know, do you outsource? Do you hire internally? Do you hire an agency, et cetera? So, and then I'll open it up for some discussion afterwards. So before we get started, I, I like to start out with this slide. And so often when I would talk to clients, there's, you know, and, and you see this same type of thing in, in many different, uh, you know, venues and many different in situations, but, you know, there's always like what you want and then what you can afford, right? And they don't always align. So sometimes, you know, you want the biggest and the best and the greatest, but, you know, all you can afford is a, you know, toothless meth addict, right? So, so this, you know, so we start with, this question of what do you need? Not necessarily what do you want, right? Everyone wants, you know, uh, you know, a Lamborghini, but you know, is that what you need? And is that what's practical to go to the store and buy groceries every week? Um, so in terms of what you need, the first and most important thing to think of is the type of project you have. And, you know, I'm gearing this talk somewhat directly towards, you know, say an entrepreneur but you know, this also could extend even for a large company when you have, you're hiring somebody to work on a specific project. Um, so what's the type of project, right? I've talked to entrepreneurs who you know, have told me like, oh, I'm gonna start a school, a brand new school. It's gonna you know, replace all the universities that are out there. It's gonna be this online school and we're doing an online educational platform. And I'm like, well, wait, that's two different companies, right? Are you starting a school or are you starting an online education program? Because you're going to be way too busy with either one of those projects to do either of them well. So focus on one, right? Either start a school or start a, you know, a new coding platform. And if you want to do that, if, if your project is software, right, which is great, you know, we're going to create some kind of software as a service or some kind of new platform or new mobile app. That's, if that's your project, you should really have someone on the founding team, someone at the C-level, for example, that knows that world, that, understand, that understands coding at least in a way that they can guide you, you know, properly and advise you properly. And, you know, maybe at the very least have someone on your board of directors that you're meeting with, you know, weekly or monthly, um, because you're, if you're not an expert on development, but you're planning to do uh, an app that's development based, you know, that's the, that's high risk. Like one of my weaknesses I know is in finance, right? That's one of the reasons why my, my co-founder of Boca Code is a finance guy, because it's not my strength. I would not go out and say, you know what, I've got this great idea for a new finance company, right? That's, that's not what I would do because that's not my area of expertise. So anyway, I, let me get down off of my soapbox for a minute here and get back to what's the type of project you're building, right? If what you're building is really software, if that's what you're building, you should plan about a third of your budget should be on development. If what you're building is not software, 
If it's not that, then try and look for shortcuts you can take, pre-built software where you don't necessarily need maybe a full-time development team, but you can utilize ex you know, stuff that exists already. And, oh, somebody can draw on the screen, that's cool. Um, <laughs> and so I guess that's the whiteboard feature somebody's using. Um, so, you know, and please feel free if you have questions as I go, put them in chat, come off mute, holler at me, whatever, or, you know, write, write your question on the screen. Um, so also not just what are you building, what type of project you have, but also the stage of your project. Um, do we know if we can erase that? I'm just curious if I can, ah, here we go, clear, clear all drawings. There we go. Sorry. So what stage is your project in? If you're in the, you know, if you're in the maturity or expansion stage, you can probably afford a really high-end developer. You could probably afford to build out a huge development team. But if you're in more of the startup or growth stage of your project, you know, you, you really are at a point where you should be conserving money, conserving cash, and trying to, trying to focus on bringing in new clients. So how do you do that, right? So if you're a startup company, you should try not to hire developers, right? Developers are one of the highest paid professions in the US, right? You basically, you have doctors, and I know it varies, but basically doctors, lawyers, and developers are pretty much the three highest paid professions in, at least in the US. So if you're looking to hire a bunch of developers and build stuff, you're gonna expect to pay for that right? Developers can be very expensive. And if you're in a startup, you should be looking to conserve money as much as possible. I know I'm doing myself a disservice. I'm running a school. I'm going to want you to hire my developers. And what am I telling you? Don't hire developers, right? Um, but I'm also looking out for you as a business person that, you know, during this phase, your two main goals should be conserving cash and getting new clients. But then as you get into the growth and expansion phases, you want to higher up and start, start building. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing you want to build is your MVP. And this is really important. And I know that you guys know this. I know that business people know this, but this is always how an idea starts, right? Entrepreneurs, they have an idea. It's a spark. And that spark bursts into a flame. And before you know it, it's this raging inferno. They come up with this idea and then they're like, oh, and I can add this and add this and then we can build this and grow it into this. And now you've just added 5,000 features to your original idea. And they're awesome. That's great. You should have that passion. But when you go to build, go back to that original spark, go back to that minimum viable product and say, okay, where did this idea start? What can I start with? And let's build that and try and get as many people onto that platform, whatever it is, as possible. So one of the things that I, I often am doing with clients is, and, and with, as, a, as a business advisor, is taking these big ideas that us entrepreneurs have and trying to scale it down. And that's what I look to my advisors to do, right? Because I'm like, oh, with Book of Code, we're going to do this and this and this and this. And then my advisors say, okay, settle back in. And let's reel this back in and, and focus. So it's, it's a natural tendency. And that's why we have to have smart people around us to help us with that. So focus on building out the minimum. Okay, so what type of developer, right? In terms of your needs, what type of developer do you need? Well, there's, there are what we call front-end developers, right? These are gonna be people who are designing websites or apps, the part that faces the user, the part that the user actually inter interfaces with, the buttons, the dials, the switches, the graphics, all of that. And, and then there's the backend developer. And Joel Lord, great guy, came down to Florida one time, gave us a, an awesome talk. And he liked, he, he explained front end and back end as like for a restaurant, right? You walk into a restaurant, you walk into the front end of a restaurant and you've got the tables and the tablecloths and the chairs and the maitre d' and the, and the servers and everyone's friendly and smiling. And you don't get to see the back end. The back end is the kitchen. And in the kitchen, you've got the chef and they're yelling, you know, she's yelling at people, what to, you know, and she's got sous chefs and there's the freezer, there's the deep storage and 
people are running between the freezer and, and cooking things. And then the servers go and get the food and bring it out to you. And it's nice and calm and, and pretty. So that's the front end. The front end is, is the, the part of the restaurant that we see. The back end is the kitchen. And another way of explaining this is, you know, imagine if, um, imagine if Palm Beach Tech, when you go to put your resume online, they have this great interface. Oh, upload your resume here and put your name and do all this stuff and you hit save and nothing happens, right? Your resume goes nowhere, right? So that's what the back end is for, is for taking the data from the front end. Um, exchanging data between the front end and some services somewhere, typically. So backend developers focus more on the business logic, on the saving the data, on the exchanging the data, showing the data, things like that. Then you have what I call a full stack in quotes developer, which is somebody that does front end and back end. And you know, a lot of people are trained to do both. They they might prefer one or the other, but they know how to do both at least to some degree. And I put that in quote because a lot of times we call ourselves full stack developer if we do some front end and back end. Then there's DevOps. And DevOps is how do we put, how do we serve the website? We have to put it up in the cloud. We have to make the data available. So usually, you know, if you have a good DevOps person, you might only need them at the beginning of the project. And then you might need them, you know, a couple of hours here and there. But oftentimes for a smaller project, you don't need somebody managing that full time. So if you have a real true full stack developer, which is the last category I have here, that's somebody that knows front end, back end, and can do some DevOps. They can deploy to the cloud. They can manage, make your app scalable, things like that. So these are the primary categories of developer. And then you also have some other categories. So there's a term, a term which I've coined called web editor, patent pending. Um, so please credit me anytime you use this term. Just kidding. But I like this term a lot. These are people who build sites on Wix, build sites on Squarespace. They make WordPress sites. And they like to call themselves web developers, but they're not quite web developers. They don't often know how to code or how to build a, build a website from scratch. So I, I call them, I call them web editors, right? They know how to edit a website. They know how to put the pieces together, but they don't know how to build those pieces from scratch. Um, there's mobile developers, database administrators, systems architects, and more specialized fields. Um, you know, these are all different types of developers that you might need depending on the size and the scope of your project. And then there's the level of developer, right? What level of developer do you need? So oftentimes people are afraid of junior developers because they're worried like, oh, well, they're inexperienced and they don't know how to solve all the problems that are gonna come up. They don't know how to do all the things. But I love working with junior developers. I, in fact, I hire junior developers over, over any other developer almost, almost all of the time. And the reason why is they're very eager. They work really hard. They want to learn new things. So when you challenge them, when you push them, they will go out and figure it out. And a good junior developer has a network to fall back on. They have people that they trained with. They have friends. They have a cohort that they went to school with. Um, you know, they have Boca Code behind them or Iron Hack or WinCode or Flatiron, where they can turn and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm stuck on something, help me. And, you know, this is where the senior developer comes in and says, oh, let me help you. But junior developers, they're passionate, they're excited, they're energetic, and they want to learn and do new things. So I love juniors, plus they're way more affordable, right? You can hire three junior developers for the price of one senior. So they can be very, very valuable. Mid-level developers are almost like a completely different species. Mid-level developers, they typically have set in their ways, this is the right way to do things. There's no other way to do it. Here's how to do it. And they're head down and they're coding. And they just spend all day coding. And they don't have to look things up because they know their way of doing things and that's the right way. And these can be great to have on your team as well because they're workhorses. They get shit done. 
they will plow through and they will just work and work and work and work. Um, so there's a question that in the, um, in the chat that says, what's more valuable for a startup having like three juniors or one senior? And ideally, ideally, Monica, what you want is you want to balance because each one of these developers has their own, their own like pros and cons, right? Like the junior is inexperienced, but they're passionate and they're going to try and learn. But if they have a senior developer that they can, that can mentor them, it makes them so much more valuable. So the ideal would be to say, have like one junior and one senior or one senior and two juniors, right? Or a junior, a mid-level, a senior, you know, so you get a little bit of everything because they are different. They're like different species. A, a senior developer, you can tell a senior developer when you walk into an office because they have fidget toys on their desk. They spend less of their time actually coding and more of their time writing on the whiteboard, wandering around, fidgeting with a toy, uh, walking around talking to people because the way a senior developer works, they know that putting their head down in coding is not the way to solve a problem. The way to solve a problem is to step back and think about it, figure out a solution, and then sit down and write code. So a, a good senior developer will spend 80 to 90% of their time thinking and maybe 10% of their time writing code because they know how to write the code. It's figuring out what code to write. So you have a problem and you, sit, and you think about it. And then when you sit down to write the code, it takes two seconds. It's no problem to, to write that code. And I worked on a team with a junior and a mid-level and I was in meetings and I was running around and doing all this stuff. And they would be hours and hours working on a problem. And I would walk up and I'd say, what are you guys doing? And they're like, oh, we're trying to figure this out. And I'd look and I'd be like, oh, change that and do that and that'll work. And they would be like, son of a gun. And they would like, you know, shake their fists at me. Like they were two people working for hours on that. I'd look at it in an instant and know the solution. But what they didn't always realize was that their hours and hours and hours got them really close to the solution. So when I looked, I saw what they had done and that last step that they were missing. I couldn't have seen that if they didn't have those hours of work there, right? So it would have taken me, you know, might not have taken me hours and hours, but it's still, they don't, you know, they just see the, the last, me taking them from, you know, 90% to 100, which is oftentimes the hardest part. And then after senior, you get to this level that um, people often call like a systems architect. The systems architect is not typically the person that writes code. This is usually like <clears throat> a super, super senior developer. And they, they would, they'll take a project and they'll say, okay, from start to finish, this is what the project looks like. Here's how we're going to build it. This is the right way to build it. This is this is the technology we're gonna use. This is how we're gonna deploy it. And they see the big picture and they could write it out and draw it out. And I used to do this a lot with my, my development. My, when I ran my own agency, I'd have a team, a room full of developers and I would sketch out the project for them and be like, go now go build. And they were like, yes, they would see the pieces and it's like an architect, right? We developers are a lot like, are a lot like contractors, right? If you tell a contractor, build me a house, they're gonna say, well, where are the plans, right? I could build you anything you want, what am I building? So the architect comes in and says, here are the plans, and then they go build. And that's really fun to do. And I love being an architect. I just hate the part of not coding. So I, I, I would always step in in that role, but I personally love to code way too much so I can't keep myself in that role. Um, <laughs> Jen Nelson says, if their laptop is full of stickers, they might be a senior developer. Yeah. And I have actually stacks of stickers here that we're, we're giving away from at Poca Code. So if you want any free stickers, let us know. We'll send you some. So that's the level of developer. That kind of gets you an idea of maybe what am I looking for, right? You know, what is my project? What level is my company at? And, you know, what type, what flavor of developer and what level of developer do I need? And then 
I'm kind of skipping ahead, right? Saying, okay, now you found somebody, what are the questions you ask? And then, the, and then we'll go back. I'm Tarantinoing this, right? You found a developer now, what do you ask them? And then I'm gonna to get to the, how do you find this person? Where do you look? So what do you ask a developer? And I'm going to I'm going to skip over all the generic interview type questions, you know, what was the time that you faced adver ad adversity and blah 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 blah. You know, all those BS interview questions um, you know, and I'm going to talk like tell you questions that you can ask a developer that that you'll be speaking their language and give you a sense of the types of answers that they might give you and what you should be looking for. So one of the first things to ask them is what stack do you use, right? And, and in, the, in the dev world, the term stack is our technology stack. What are, the, what are the programming languages we like to use? How do we like to deploy that kind of thing? And you get a lot of different answers on this. You know, um, there's basically in terms of modern languages today, the primary ones that, that we see used, and there's a lot of others. I'm not trying to be exhaustive here, but you know, you see JavaScript and Python. Those are by far the two most popular globally. Um, PHP is kind of on its way out. It was, it was the leader for decades, and now new projects are not typically in PHP anymore. Ruby became really popular out West on the West Coast for startups, but it, because it's quick, it's really good to like, get a project off the ground, but then once you prove it, you go back and you rewrite it in JavaScript. So I say just freaking start in JavaScript, don't start with Ruby. Um, and then there's C Sharp, which is used for game development. Um, we use it a lot in like VR and AR and in finance and, and you know, it's more of like corporate, corporate America. Um, but you'll hear things, you know, like people say, oh, I knew I use Node or I use React or I use, Vue or Angular, those are all JavaScript, right? Um, they might say Django, that's, that's a framework, that uh, Python framework, Laravel, Rails, .NET, those all, I'm showing you where those all fit in to help you translate. If you don't know these technologies, you can see they all fit into these categories, right? And then aside, what, the, what people do often is they'll use combinations, right? On the back end, I use Node, and on the front end, I use React. So they'll take the, the N from Node and the R from React, and they'll put them together, and we get these acronyms. Like you'll say, oh, I'm a MERN developer, or I'm a MEAN developer. And this is telling you I use, um, I use a Mongo database. I use Express for serving my app. I use React on the front end and Node on the back end, right? in a lot of the local companies are using either MERN or MEAN. The old guy around the block that you still see, you still see some of, and in, in a lot of medical companies are using LAMP, excuse me, which is Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Um, but people are more and more using MEAN and MERN. MERN is by far one of the most popular. And now what's becoming really popular and by far my favorite is FERN which is Firebrace, Express, React, and Node. This is one that I, I, love, to, I love to play with and, and teach. Um, but the bottom line is, with both of these, is if you ask me, if you're looking to hire me and you say, well, what stack do you use? Or, or what would you use to build my, my project? The right answer is, it depends on the project, right? Just like if you ask, you wouldn't ask a contractor well, what, what tools are you going to use to build my house? You know, like, well, whoa, whoa, what are we building your house out of? And what is, you know, is it all glass? Is it granite? Is it wood? You know, I'm probably going to use a hammer at some points and I'm probably going to use a saw, but you know, the, the tools, the right tools for the job depend on the job. And so what your project is, you know, you might, you know, you might be a big corporation and you're already set. This is our stack. Do you work in this stack? Yes. Great. But if you're just starting, if you have a brand new project and you're asking somebody to possibly build you a, you know, your dream application or whatever, and you ask them, well, what stack are you going to use? If they know the stack that they're going to use before they know your project, they're not a good developer, right? 
or they just are limited in what they know. They only know one of these stacks. So I, I, you know, one of the things to look for is somebody who's like, well, you know, let's hear about your project and then we can talk about how we would build that. That's a good answer. Okay. Um, one of the things that I think is good to ask, and, you know, a lot of this is I'm trying to, you know, for those of you who are not developers or don't hire developers regularly, a lot of this is just kind of teaching you some of the, the vocabulary that we use and understanding some, what some of these things mean. So I often will ask a developer if they like to use frameworks or libraries. And in this case, a library is not, you know, a place where you get books and things like that. But a similar concept, if, you know, if I wanted to build a rocket ship, there are other people who've built rocket ships before. I might want to build a better one than them, but I can look and see what they did. And I could go to the library and find out what they've done in the past. In science, we call this standing on the shoulder of giants, right? You build upon what's already been done. And, you know, if, if we were building a rocket ship together and I told, you know, I told Monica, hey, Monica, you know, we need some, we need some tires for the landing gears. Monica, she's too smart to be like, okay, well, I guess I got to go get some rubber and melt it down she's gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna to go to the store and buy some tires. Those exist already. I don't have to make those from scratch. And so that's the concept here with frameworks and libraries is there are a lot of tools that we're gonna to need to build your project that already exist out there. And they might not be perfectly suited for your project, but we could start with them and then we can tweak them from there. So. I used to be a very stubborn developer and I didn't want to work with libraries and I didn't want to work with frameworks. I wanted to do everything by hand, by scratch. And then I got smart and realized I was wasting a lot of time and, and you know, reinventing the wheel over and over again. Versioning. You want to make sure that the developer that you're hiring is, knows how to use versioning and is big on versioning. And what is versioning? Well, <clears throat> if, you know, imagine in like this very, you know, ancient, ancient scenario, right? Where you're actually emailing someone a Word document back and forth, right? You know, back in like the days before fire, um, <clears throat> you email someone a Word document and they're gonna make changes. You wanna track those changes, right? You're gonna tell them, turn on track changes and so that when I get the document back, I could see what you changed and I could decide, you know, in each place if I want to accept the change. That's, that's, the, same, um, that's the same concept with versioning is except with versioning in code, every single line of code that gets changed gets, gets recorded as a change. And there's a history of that going back to the beginning of the project who changed it, when they changed it, and what change was made. So that, you know, if, and this happens to me all the time, I get somebody, you know, I get somebody calling and saying, hey, listen, back on June 15th, we started noticing da 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 da. Can you look and see what changed on June 15th? And then I'll go back to the project and I'll look at what was changed on or around June 15th with the code. And you can see that and you can revert back. And, um, Angel and, and Omar were asking um, how much version control does a junior dev need to know? And you know, when I teach junior devs, this is the first thing I teach them. I think it is the, one of the most important things. Um, you should know how much do you, about version control do you need to know? You need to know how to, how to you know, add, commit, and push. You need to know how to make a branch and you need to know how to do a pull request. And you don't need to know how to accept a pull request and review code. The, your, your more senior developers can do that, but you should be, you should, you should branch off to a new branch in the code. You should then, you know, test that. And then when you're ready to merge back in, you do what's called a pull request and have a senior developer review that with you. And what's awesome about that is it gives a senior developer a chance to look at your code and tell you things that you could be doing better. So for you, it's this amazing learning opportunity to like line by line of your code, have somebody reviewing it that can tell you how to improve your code. 
So for me, this is, you know, this is like day one of teaching, right? You learn about version control and then you can start looking line by line at your code and, and seeing, you know, where you can improve it um, before it gets merged in. And that's, you know, that's what we do for, for our clients is, you know, we can have, we can have a very junior developer working on their project, but nothing gets merged in until it's checked by somebody very senior and knows that every line of code is being, is being carefully looked at. So this is a way where you can have people who, who are, you know, maybe not so experienced, maybe not so confident working on production level code, but it never, their code doesn't get pushed to production without going through testing and review and so forth before it gets deployed. So, you know, Omar and Angel, I think it's, I think it's critically important that at least you understand the basics of Git. You know, there is SVN, but that's like Betamax. Like no one uses SVN anymore. It has some benefits over Git, but by far the industry has adopted Git. So this is the way, you know, we almost, almost all now universally use GitHub um, for version control and, and um, for our repositories. And then you, you know, you might also ask a developer what their deployment strategy is. And, you know, yeah, a very junior developer might be like, oh, what, a what strategy? What, what are you talking about? But, you know, somebody who you want working on your project, they should maybe have some sense of maybe not all of these stages and everything, but some idea of like either blue green deployment or um, having at least like a staging environment or like a sandbox um, where they can, where you can test code, right? So the, the idea, the ideal is for me is I work locally, right? I, I work on my local computer. I run your application locally. I test it, I develop locally, I make sure it works. And then once I have, um, yeah, Andrew said, even Microsoft is using Git, right? So I run the app locally, and once I've I've made the changes that I'm ready to ready to to deploy, I will push them to a develop environment, and then now it's like in a live environment. It's not where the public can see it, but it's a live environment where other people from the team can now test it, and then once it's been tested there, then it goes to a staging environment. Now this is a little. Some people think this is a little excessive depends on the size of the team. It depends on how many people you have, et cetera. But in the staging environment, you kind of then leave it to, you know, the product owners to test now. Like, okay, we built those things you wanted, test them, make sure they work. And then when they're ready, we can deploy to production. So it's like local, develop, staging, production. And that's a really cool deployment strategy. That's now, a lot of projects aren't going to be to that level, but the idea of having somewhere where you can deploy to test and then deploy to production is, is really beneficial. Another question developers get asked often is what if you get stuck? This is the, you know, for those of you who've ever seen like who wants to be a millionaire, it's the, you know, it's the lifeline, phone a friend, you know, 50, 50, whatever. Um, you know, pull the audience, right? Stack overflow, call a friend. I actually got asked this in an interview one time and I didn't know, but they had already hired someone for the position. And then they saw my resume and they're like, hmm, you know what, let's interview that guy. I mean, we already hired somebody, but let's interview that guy. He looks really interesting. And we went through and they asked me all these questions and then they're like, what if you get stuck? What if you don't understand the code? And I was like, not understand the code. Like, I don't know, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you know, it's a new language, maybe you don't, and I'm like, all the languages are the same. They all come from C, they're all, you know, and I went on this whole thing, like, you know, I, if I get stuck, I'm going to puzzle through it. I'm going to figure it out. And he was like, well, that's so much better than this other guy told us. He said he has a friend he can call, you know, if he ever gets stuck. And, and so they ended up rescinding the offer to that guy and hiring me, which I kind of feel guilty about, but, you know, um, it is what it is, but I, I think this is a very uh, telling question, right? Um, and then finally, you know, I'm kind of running out of time here, so I wanna I wanna move along. But you know, so that was the you know, what do you ask the person? But not, now it's who are you asking this to, right? Who do you look for? And this is the final section here. Who do you look for, right? Depend, and this of course depends on your project, right? 
Um, you know, it depends on the level you're at. It depends on the type of, of developer you want, but where do you go for this person or, or who do you look for? And one thing that people often jump to is I want to hire somebody internally. I want to bring on a developer to my team. And there's a lot of benefits to that, right? You've got the person right there. You have immediate feedback. Hey, can you change this one thing real quick? Done. Okay. It's on the website. Awesome. Thank you. You get this immediate feedback and you can supervise them. You can see what they're doing. So there's a lot of benefits to having an in-house team. The, the downsides is the downsides are you have a lot of overhead. You have, you know, a lot of times those, the developers need resources internally. And I'm not just talking about the really good coffee maker that we all need. I'm not just talking about, you know, having a ping pong table or, you know, AstroTurf on the roof with, you know, um, you know, games and, and a lounge and, and beer on tap. But also, you know, like I said to Monica, like having junior developers, they might need a senior developer that they can, that can mentor them even just, you know, one day a week. Um, acquiring talent can be very expensive and difficult. Um, and then you have to train them. So, you know, there's a lot of pros, but there's also, you know, some, some, some heavy overhead to having an in-house team. So for a larger company, more mature company, this is gonna be ideal, but for a small startup, this may not be, right? Then you've got the agency. And this is the, you know, this is the sexy, like this is what you want, right? Agencies are sexy. Um, they have a full staff. They've got UX, they've got design, they've got seniors, juniors, mobile, they've got everyone you want. Right? They've got all the resources, they've got all the experience, they have the architects, they know how to build your project. Um, so what's the cons? Well, oftentimes it's pricing, right? So, and I'm not trying to say Silver Logic and Peak Activity are expensive. What I'm trying to say is these are like the this is where you should go in most cases, is go to a Silver Logic, go to a Peak Activity, right? These are, these are both Palm Beach Tech members. They're great agencies. I've worked with both of them. Um, I know people at both of them. They're awesome, right? This is the what you want, right? And, but something to keep in mind in any case is you've all seen this triangle in one shape or form or, well, that was funny, a triangle in one shape or another. No. Okay. In one form or another, right? You've seen this triangle they say, you know, do you want it good, fast, or cheap? Pick two, right? You can't have all three. So, you know, what you what you want to what you you know what you might be able to afford is the cheap, and the cheap might not even be fast, but it's probably not going to be good. And you know, so what you know, but the the good might be good, it might be fast, but it's probably not going to be cheap. And a lot of these agencies will work with you, you know, if you want to cut costs. You know, maybe they'll do it slower. They they probably won't want to do it less good, but they probably can you know can work with you on on a balance between speed and and cost sometimes. Um, but overall, you know, you're going to be paying to get that good quality and get it done quickly. So, but there are, there are other options, right? Local freelancers. I have a handful of local freelancers that I I refer out to projects all the time. And a lot, of, a lot of young developers come to me and they're like, hey, do you have any projects? These are oftentimes super eager people. You get fast response. You can meet them in person. They're local. Um, the cost can vary. You know, it just, it really depends on, on what you're building. You know, where, where do you want to be on that triangle? Um, cons are sometimes, you know, some of these local freelancers are not the best quality. Um, sometimes they're not the fastest. And like I said, the cost can vary. And also how quickly they respond and so forth can depend on how many projects they have, right? So if they're very successful, they end up having a lot of projects and um, you know, they, they may not be able to respond as quickly. But if you're interested, you know, contact me. I put my email here, Todd at Boca Code. I know a lot of freelancers that would love to work on your project. Then you have non-local freelance, right? Outsource, and I'm almost done. I've got a couple more slides left. Non-local, like freelance or non-local freelancer outsourcing, you can get super low rates with this, but the quality can vary dramatically. I've gotten ripped off a lot. 
um, speed can vary greatly. And, and what happens is a lot of times you get a low hourly rate, but they can take 10, 20, 100 times as long to do a project as, as a good developer here would take. So you end up spending more. Um, I've, I've seen this countless times where people outsource, they get this incredible, like, oh my God, I'm only paying them 10 bucks an hour, but then they pay them a thousand hours to do nothing. And, and, and you're throwing out your money. So, you know, this can be, this can be a, a high risk situation, but the key is communication and make sure if you're hiring somebody outsourced that you have somebody that, that responds quickly and that you can understand well. Um, so I want to reiterate that clear communication is key. This is, I can't, I can't emph emphasize this enough, how important this is to getting your project done correctly and quickly and efficiently is having somebody that you can communicate with clearly. And in case I didn't iterate this enough with this big, bright pink and orange slide, I'm going to say this again in a different way. Hire a team that understands your project. I had a friend who outsourced to a team in India and he was working on a real estate project. They didn't understand what a parcel was. They didn't understand what a foreclosure was. They didn't know what a, you know, forget a Liz Pendens, which a lot of people here don't even know. So hire a team that, that understands you. And then finally, there's actually a new option. And this is, a, I've tried to give you a very fair and balanced look. This is gonna get into a little bit of self-promotion, but I'm gonna try and keep it as fair and balanced as I can. But this is, as far as I know, no one's ever done this really before. But Boca Code is a teaching institute that does development projects for local companies. So what are the benefits? You get low rates, right? Because we're a teaching institute, this is not how we make our money. You get quality assurance, right? You have senior devs overlooking every line of code you get very fast response. We're local. We've got a huge team that, you know, that's available at, at any hours of the day. Um, and we even have an option through Palm Beach Tech where you can donate to a scholarship and we build your app. So if you're making enough money, you can get a tax write-off. We can talk about that, but that could be, for some of you, it's not even an option, but for some, it could be a huge pro. Cons are, you know, the speed can vary, right? Again, it's this, where do you want to be on that triangle? Um, so, you know, if you're interested, you can reach out to us on that. So just in summary, I just want to sum up and then, and then I'll, I'll thank you guys and take some questions. But if you have a really large project, if you're, you know, big corporation, you probably either want to use an agency or go in house. Those are probably your best options. If you have a smaller to medium sized project, I would recommend either local freelance or using a teaching institute. Um, so that's what I got. I just want to say thank you guys. And please check us out, bocacode.com. We're brand new and we want to kick ass and we do all kinds of training and, and uh, you know, corporate training, individual training. So uh, please check us out. And, and that's all I have for you, bocacode.com. And now I'll just, you know, take any questions you guys have. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, You've been pretty good at keeping up with the chat and answering the questions in there. Um, and right, but I can't Omar see Omar says you're killing it. <laughs> Thanks, Omar. Um, yeah, does anybody um, have any questions? You guys are totally welcome to take yourself off mute if you do. Yeah, Angel just asked if we're hiring. We, we aren't currently, but I always encourage people to send me your resume. First of all, I'll be happy to review and criticize your resume for you and tell you why you're not getting hired. That's a, that's a service I offer even non Boca code members. You can join our Slack. You can get see jobs that we post. Um, so we do career services for the community right now, not just our members. Um, but I always say, you know, send me your resume because, you know, as, as Jen will tell you who I hired at a Palm Beach <laughs> tech event like this, um, when the job comes up, I just, I have this tendency of grabbing the person nearest to me who I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, you'd be perfect. And I grab them and we don't, I have, I have yet to have to post a job because I get, I have all these people around me, really talented people that I work with all the time, you know, like Jen, like Ashley, like Mariella, um, my whole team. It's just these amazing, brilliant people that I've worked with before and, and, you know, or met and just the timing was right and I needed somebody and I grabbed them. 
So, you know, Angel, we don't, we don't post jobs very often because I, I have such connections in the community, um, which is amazing. I, you know, again, I can't emphasize how much I love the Palm Beach Tech, South Florida Tech community, um, but we have all these connections. So there's always somebody within arm's reach of me that when I need them. So, um, but please feel free, you know, shoot me an, e shoot me an email, Todd at bocacode.com. Or if you go to bocacode.com, you can one click join our Slack. And then you've got, I'm in that Slack channel almost 24 seven. So you've got very easy access to me there. Yes, thank you. Um, I, Monica, Ali, do you guys see anything on social as far as for uh, questions or comments too? No, we're all good. Okay, hey Norman, I think you, did, how are you must circles? have done a really good job, Todd, <laughs> and answered everybody's <laughs> questions. So Norman says he's using circles, which I've been really interested in, and I was just wondering. I, I had a question for him: is how is it? I think you see us all in little circles, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of weird because it's like a, a widget on top of everything that you have on the Mac, and then if, if it's covering something that you have uh, on the other so software that you might be using, you have to be moving around the whole strip of circles with faces. Well, that's when I present, that's how it is for me too. I see you guys in a strip and if you're covering something I need to get to, I have to drag the strip to get to it. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, any good. other questions for me? I don't see anything. I think you've uh, answered them all. Um, oh, Angel, more general question. How do we get to the expo booth? So if Down you hall, signed, yeah, right. right. Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> no. Um, if, um, if you RSVP, did you RSVP angel through, um, through Eventbrite for it? Cause you should have received like a confirmation email with a, uh, login. Um, if not, I am dropping my email right here. If you want to send me a quick email and then I can send you all that. And, and with a training video included as well, just to help you. I'm also, I'm going to send in the chat, um, Pierce's email. So it's, it's Pierce, P-E-A-R-S-E -E, at bocacode.com. He's our biz dev person. So if you're a local business and you want to get in touch with us, um, you know, if you're afraid, if you're afraid of me or Jen, um, you can reach out to Pierce and he handles, yeah, because Jen's got her claws out. Um, <laughs> you know, he's, uh, he's, he's somebody that, you know, does, does a lot of our networking with direct, you know, B2B b2b stuff so awesome well and um to answer your question vanessa the expo is actually not through zoom it's through a platform called premier virtual they're another member of ours um so if anybody uh doesn't have that uh link just email me and i'll make sure to get you guys all that information because the the platform is open till 8 p.m and if you come to the boca code booth we have a zoom set up so you, if you want to if you want to continue the conversation with me or Jen will be over there, or I don't know if Jen's going to be there, but I'll be over there this afternoon. And thank you guys so much for your time and for coming and listening to my whole spiel. Thank you so much, Todd. Like always, it was a good presentation. If anybody's curious about, because uh, Todd's done a few workshops with us, both on career workshops and like intro to coding type workshops. Um, if you go to our um, YouTube page, uh, you can actually see some additional workshops from him there too. Actually, one of them on his resume writing was awesome, which we referenced in the, the career workshop this morning as well. So if anybody needs that, just hold over to YouTube. Yeah, your all's resumes are terrible. I was looking at resumes today. They're awful. So you all need to watch that video yeah, <laughs> step by yeah. step. Here's how to write your resume. <laughs> <laughs> but but in, in all seriousness, if you if you want me to re, you know give you guys any feedback on your resume, um, even though we're not hiring today, you know, tomorrow might be different. Um, but also I'm happy to, to look at it and tell you, you know, if I see, you know, some red flags of why I think you're not getting a job right now, um, I can, I can help you reform that, reformat your resume into something that, that will attract the eyes of a hiring manager. And thank you, Monica. She actually just dropped the link uh, in Zoom for everybody. Um, and that's, I agree that You've always getting constructive criticism from somebody like you is better than getting that criticism from the person you're interviewing with. So 
All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining. I think that's it because we're right at time. Um, again, if anybody needs anything, just check out the links that we dropped there. And of course, uh, my email address, if anybody needs to get in touch with Todd, anybody that was mentioned here, I'm more than happy to send that information out. Yeah, Thanks we so can much. all put you in touch with each other too. Like Nikki yes. knows my email. I know her. We all know each other. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Bye.